Hi guys, welcome back. This is Match Hat episode 218, featuring the third installment of my interview with Mr. Guido Hinkle. This part of the interview, we talk about game manuals and Guido's books, and we also talk about the German role-playing game, the pen and paper game, The Dark Eye, and then, of course, Realms of Arcania 1 and 2. A lot of great, great stuff in this segment, so without further ado, here is Mr. Guido Hinkle. Okay, so I got a question here from Paul Poussin, or Poussin, I guess it's Poussin, <laughs> which I, one of those. So he wants to know something about a game called Kaiser. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, that is so long ago. That was one. I... Yeah, you know, like I mentioned earlier, during those times, I also did contract work. And Kaiser was a game uh, where I did a port. I'm trying to remember which way. I either got the Amiga version and was supposed to make an Atari version or vice versa. I think it was, I think I received the Atari version and had to port it over to the Amiga. It was a nightmare because the way it was set up and all that was pretty tricky. There was a lot of very platform specific assembly language in it that had to be completely rewritten. And unfortunately, that was in the strategy part of the game. So the entire strategy engine was in assembly language completely without comments, and I had to rewrite it. And I spent countless days just trying to figure out what each piece of code is doing. And in the end, you know, it, it, it turned into a complete nightmare for me and for the publisher who gave me the contract at the time because it's like, you know, I can't do it. You know, they kept asking me, where is the game? I said, it's right here, but it's not running. <laughs> it's like one of those things. I wish I could hand it to you right now, but you do not want to sell this. What about a game called Oath? For the the Oath. Yeah, you know, the Oath. Oath was, yeah, the Oath was an interesting experiment. It's a shoot 'em up game that we did on the Amiga. And it was at the time when Attic Entertainment Software turned from being a developer to becoming a publisher. Uh, the step we took at the time was I should probably go back further. The reason why we, to, why we wanted to become a publisher was because we got ripped off by publishers a lot in the past. And we realized in order to really take our own destiny into our own hands, we have to become a publisher. That's where the control is. That's where the money is. And fortunately enough, we had a completed game in our, you know, in the, in the desk ready to go out because no publisher was capable of putting it out for us. We had deals signed, we had contracts and everything, and you know, publishers never really released it. So we said, we have this game, we could publish it tomorrow if we wanted to. And we did. That was a text adventure, Drachen von Lars, with the role-playing influences. And we said, okay, let's, see, let's do this. Let's try to get some money, create a box, create manuals, all these things, try to sell it. And we did. We got into retail. We really went all the way out. We talked to the retail chains. We managed to get major deals with distributors to really get the game out. And it sold in quantities. And that enabled us and it built a financial base for us that we could say, okay, we can move forward with this because that's really critical in that early phase that you create enough revenue that you can build other products and that you can, you know, produce them and ship them to retail, which is, you know, very cost intensive. So, of course, once you build that channel, you need to fill the pipeline. You need to have more products because if you approach all those retail stores once every other year with a new product, they're like, you know, these guys are so unimportant. Why do we even deal with them? So it was important for us to build a pipeline. And I remembered I had a friend in the UK by the name of Jonathan Small who was one of the smartest programmers I had ever met. And I thought, you know, if I could get Jonathan to write a game for us, I know it would be a kick-ass game. It would really rock. And he was a dedicated Amiga programmer at the time. So I gave him a call and said, Jonathan, what do you think? Make a shoot 'em up game for me because that's your strength. I'm going to find an artist to work with you. You put it on the Amiga. We'll try to make an Atari version as well. We'll try to sell it and see what happens. And he's like, sure, let's do that. And we hired an artist to work with him. So the two of them were really close. Uh, he even, for the time period, he came over and moved to, into my house. He was staying in my house at the time to develop the game. And it was like you know, almost 24 hours a day, you know, he would cr be cranking at the game, the artist sitting next to him, and me in the background play testing the game, the other guys from Attic, you know, tr trying to do their stuff. and all. So it was a very intensive uh, effort at the time to create that game very quickly. And I thought 
it was a really cool game in the end. Unfortunately, there was such a flood at the time on the Amiga, you know, of R-type style shoot 'em ups that the game never really caught on that well. But I think people who played it, and even now in retrospect who remember it, I think they think very fondly of it because it was a very tough and colorful shoot 'em up game. So you mentioned you got ripped off by publishers. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on that. I'd rather not. <laughs> You know, no, you know, those, those are, the, yeah, you know, those are the kind of things you you don't really talk about. It's like, publishers are still around, then. Yeah, uh, none of them. You know, you know, that's a funny thing about it, and that's what I always say. What comes around goes around. It has to do with karma. You know, if you rip off people, you're not going to get far in this business because it's a very small industry. Word spreads. You know, people know that you're no good, and they would stay away from you. And that's exactly what happened to them. You know. Uh, yeah, eventually they had to close shop because not only did nobody give them games anymore, but because, you know, people started filing lawsuits against them because they wouldn't pay. And, you know, that can become even costlier and it broke many of them, you know. Good riddance. So before we get into the realms of Arcania games, I did want to <clears throat> talk about game manuals because I know you've done a lot of them. And you yeah. also mentioned some boxes and things. I mean, this to me seems like such a lost art. I don't remember the last time I got a game that had a really great manual. So yeah. I just wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit about the, the manuals and sort of the, beyond the game itself, those other materials that really made an impression. I mean, for me, I was introduced to them through Infocom again. You know, when I bought my first Infocom game and I opened the box, I was like, oh my God, what is all that stuff? I mean, it was literally pouring out. You open it, it's like, boom, like a jack in the box. There was so much stuff in, you know. And depending on the game, there were 3D glasses and all sorts of gimmicks and just swag over and over. And it was fun. It was part of the experience overall. And uh, that sort of built in me that love for these kinds of materials. And it continued on, you know, later you had Ultima with the map and all that, the cloth map, the good manuals and all that. I always felt it added to the experience and it gives you more perceived value. If you want people to spend a lot of money on a product and all you give them is a jewel case, sorry, I don't see that relationship. It is not working. And obviously a lot of other people feel exactly the same way. So uh, it's always been my approach to say, what can we do, you know, not only in terms of how much can we provide, but how can we provide quality content? And in the realms of Arcania games, again, we try to really create manuals that had all the necessary information. And it's also important to remember in those days, in-game tutorials were not common. You know, that was uh, not something that had been discovered yet. Um, so we had to really explain how do you play this game. You had to explain how do you install it. In those days, that was a challenge all by itself with all the different configurations. You know, you had to have almost half the manual just describe what to do if you don't have sound or if you didn't have the proper graphics running. It was a nightmare, but it was part of the overall experience. Uh, and then you had to go out and really explain the game. What is the player supposed to do? How do you do it? You had to explain the user interface, every little step, you know, every menu entry you had in the game. You had to outline and show and tell people this is what it does. So by their very nature, uh, manuals, instruction manuals became pretty big and bulky things. And especially in role-playing games where you have so much variety and so much flexibility and options for the players, you had to line it all out. Uh, on top of that, you have magic. So you have, let's say you have a game and you have a hundred spells. You can't just let the player figure it out for themselves. You have to tell him. So you need a section with spells. All of them lined up and explaining what they do, their cost and so forth. So, you know, by their very nature, they became very big things. And then in order to break it up, you you tried to put some narrative in it or just some gimmick, some stuff, really just to loosen up the material that it's not really becoming a completely technical paper, but something people enjoy reading. And in Realms of Arcania, we did that and we tried to really keep it as loose as possible. And I know, for example, Brenda Brathwaite was doing the translations for the manuals here in the U.S. for the for Surtec. 
And she did a tremendous job too, you know, just trying to get the flow going to be more a writer who is more communicative, you know, more in a conversational tone, tone as opposed to turning it into a strictly technical manual. And she did an even better job on the strategy guides back then, where she didn't even have to go, you know, into the technical stuff so much. She could really just go with the flow and write, how do you play the game? What's your experience? And if you run into that guy, you know, just whack him over the head and then, you know, don't even bother thinking about him twice. Just keep going. That sort of thing, which helped a lot, too. And in those days, one of the things was also, we used to write our own strategy guides. Today, you usually farm it out. You have a company like Prima or Brady, you know, who does the strategy guides. And they do a phenomenal job. Uh, but back in those days, you know, we, we used to do them ourselves. So that was part of the job as well. I know you've got another career as a, as a writer with the, yes. with the Jason, a Jason Dark series. I'm wondering if you, did you learn how to write from doing these manuals and, and uh, strategy guides? Is that contribute to it? Not really, to be honest, you know. Uh, you would think so, but because they're so technical in nature, it's a very, very restrictive way of writing. Uh, one would also think that writing for games, especially text adventures, would really prepare you for writing books and all that. Nothing could be further from the truth, because writing linear narrative is completely different. And I think that's what appealed to me after making all those games and writing interactive fiction for such a long time, uh, my thought was, I want to write something where I can completely control what the player reads at any given time. If you make a game, being it an adventure or being it a role-playing game, you always give the player options. You never know which option is he going to take. So the story, you know, diverts and you, you cannot predict what's going to happen or in what order the player is going through certain things. If you write a novel in that kind of linear fiction, you can completely control the experience. And I was interested in that. I was like, I want to see how that feels as a writer. And I just started writing, you know, and I knew from the get-go, I was looking at a novel, it's like, whoa, this is way too big. You know, if I start that, I can almost guarantee I will never finish it. And I didn't want to do that. You know, it's like, that would be a waste of time. So I was looking for a format that was more suitable, that re would really allow me to write and complete a project within a realistic time frame. And the dime novel concept popped into my mind again, which is really big in Germany, or used to be really big in Germany when I grew up. You know, you have like these 64-page softbound magazines that are released every week with stories in them. And I thought, that might be something to try. And I started writing and, you know, patched it up, back and forth because it didn't work and all, until eventually I had something that I felt, yeah, you can read without completely cringing. <laughs> so I printed it out and gave it to my wife and said, take a look at this, what do you think? And she read it and it's like, huh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I know what you're trying to do, but it's not working. So she came in and she just took the red marker and she says, this, no, 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 change this, you know, here you're switching point of view, you're, you're doing this, no good, you know, I'm completely taken out of the experience, rewrite. So I started rewriting it over and over again, and she was always there by my side as the editor, looking at the material with a completely unbiased view and saying, it's not working, it's still not working, you know, you're trying to make an emotional impact here, it's not happening, you know, I couldn't care less what happens to this person right now. So you keep, again, and try it. Until eventually I had something that I felt was publishable, you know, and that was Demon's Night. So that was really my very first experience. So when I put it out, I was like, you know, I had so much fun doing this, I would love doing it again, uh, over and over again. So I established it, set it up as a series, the Chase and Dark Ghost Hunter series. And I, I thought to myself, okay, I could probably publish that. But I didn't want to publish it all by itself. So the notion was I'm going to write a couple of them so when I get to market, or I already have sort of catalog set up. And I kept writing. I wrote the second one, and I wrote the third one, Ghost Templar. And with each one, I, I recognized how I learned, how I became a better writer, a stronger writer, how I realized and immediately while I was writing it, really recognized the situation where it's like, I cannot do that. It will take the player, the reader out of the experience or that I recognized the situation where it's like, you know, I can completely heighten that experience if I throw this in and all. So it was a really strong learning process I was going through. 
And in addition, I was reading a lot about, you know, writing. There's a lot of literature out there from famous writers and writing instructors who really teach you how do you do it properly, 3R structure, how to create it, how to break it, these kinds of things, you know. And even Stephen King, you know, he wrote one of the greatest books on writing, and it's called, interestingly enough, On Writing, where he really goes into the details. It's like, how do you do it? Why should you do certain things and why should you avoid other things? And I took, I really ate it all up and kept writing and writing. And with each novel or novelette that I wrote, I, I felt that it became better and better and better. And eventually, you know, I had a whole series. And right now it's at 11 volumes. So we have 11 stories out there that we began selling. And it was also at the same time that the Kindle started to emerge. And that was what all, was also fascinating to me. Because I love working on the bleeding edge. Whether it's in computers... In the mobile space, I jumped in it when nobody really made games for mobile. That's when I went in and said, okay, I want to be there because I want to help shape that, that market like I did in the computer games. And with the Kindle, it was the same, same feeling. I saw something is happening. There's a digital revolution coming in books. I want to be there. And I went out and published on the Kindle from day one. I was like, I'm going to push that as hard as I can. And that was really also the incentive behind it that I said, I want to be in that market when it really explodes. Unfortunately, it exploded to such an extent that it became virtually impossible to get noticed. Ah, oh. she made some pretty good money with the Jason Dark books, right? No, not at all. No? Not at all. No, it's surprising, you know, but uh, it didn't find a market. Okay, so let's talk then about Realms of Arcadia. <laughs> Of yours are probably about ready to kill me by now. Uh, so, so first off, it's based on it's not based on the Dungeons and Dragons license at all. It's uh, got this. Uh, maybe you can help me actually learn how to pronounce this correctly. So das das Schwarze das Sch Schwarze 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 das Schwarze Auge Auge yeah okay Auge is easy enough. Well, let's just stick to realms of our team. <laughs> <laughs> or the easy. dark guy. So I'm just wondering, first, before we get into the game, can you talk about this pen and paper game and how it's different than what, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and stuff that uh, yeah. we're familiar with already? Um, Realms of Arcania used to be, a, or still is, a really big pen and paper game in Germany that outsold AD&D by a factor, I don't want to lie, but if I remember it right, it was almost 10 to 1 or so. So it was much, much more popular in Germany than D&D &D was. Uh, and it has, it, it sort of grew out of D&D &D because uh, uh, the creator saw D&D &D and said, you know, we should do something like that, but completely targeted at the German market with the different German mentality. So the fantasy world that they created feels very different than what D&D &D has. It's much more of a Nordic theme. Uh, everything you see in that universe relates to Europe, essentially, you know, you have the different countries and all that, the different regions, and if you look very closely, you could actually assign countries to those areas and say, you know, this feels almost like Great Britain, and this almost feels like the Sahara Desert, and so forth. So it was very relatable for people in Europe. Uh, and the rule system also was very different from what AT&D did, uh, in that it was much more complex. I mean, the trade system, the skill system, and magic system in, in Mount of Arcania is overwhelmingly complex. And that was also one of the challenges for us when we made the game and the computer, ultimately. But it, in, in the pen and paper game, it creates a very, very different feel, a very, very different flair than D&D &D does. Okay, so, you know, the game itself has everything that I like to see in a game. You know, we've got the full party. At the turn-based combat, uh, isometric view. Oh, what? You know, where to start discussing this? I guess maybe what, what inspired this, or what games did you sort of uh, build on? There was, I think, no immediate inspiration. Really, it built on one what we had built before, which was Spirit of Adventure, one of the role-playing games we 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 talked about earlier. Which, was, which at that time was very Bard's Tale inspired. But, of course, technology had evolved at that point beyond you know, what you could do in the Bard's Tale game. Uh, so we still had that core framework in place, though, and the, the experience of building that. 
So we said, okay, there are certain parts of that technology that we could reuse or that we can build upon and add to it. The other thing were the gold box games that SSI did at the time. We looked at those, especially for the combat, and said, you know, this is fun and all, but I think with, an, with a different graphic and visual representation of the combat, you could probably enhance it, give it a different feel, because obviously we didn't want to copy what's out in the market. We wanted to create our own identity for those games. So the isometric view came into play because it worked very well strategically in the SSI games, but we, we sort of said, okay, we want it to look differently. So we made it more graphics oriented uh, with flashier stuff, nicer characters, that sort of thing. And uh, then came the question, how do you move through the world? And we chose a first-person perspective at the time for that, just because it felt more appropriate, I would think. You know, Creating a world in, in an isometric view is enormous. You know, the resources you need to create all those sprites and those worlds, you know, make sure they tile properly without seeing, you know, looking tiled and all that. It's, an, it's a major effort, and we knew our budget was limited at the time, so we had to come up with something that is more reusable than that. And 3D just gives you that you know, opportunity to create a texture set that you can then reuse or modify a little with, with, notice, with significantly less resources than you could otherwise. And that helped us just get the game off the ground faster and get the whole thing going. But still, even, the, even though we have uh, the isometric view in combat only, that was a lot of work. Would you say this was your biggest hit to date, then? I would think Planescape Torment is probably commercially the most successful ones, even though I do not know what the actual sales numbers were. But considering, you know, the impact it has had on the role-playing community and uh, just how widespread people are aware of it, I would think, yes, that must have been commercially the biggest hit. Personally, my highlight has always been Star Trail, the second one of the Realms of Arcania games, because it was one of those games where everything fell into place. It was like the perfect storm, you know, you had stuff come together, and yes, it just worked. Yeah, I know that there were some changes to the interface between those two games. Uh, that's a lot, you know, it was, it was, again, it was a learning process. And interestingly enough, it had to do with the fact that uh, when we designed the original uh, Blade of Destiny, we were totally thinking in German terms. We were a German developer. We had no or almost no experience selling products outside of Germany. We had Ooze and some other stuff uh, selling in the UK, but we have not had the chance to really get into the American markets at the time. So we were very limited from our point of view. Uh, and it reflected itself in the design decisions we made. So when we designed uh, Blade of Destiny, we did what we thought was cool, what we thought was best for the game at the time, without really looking outside the plate much. Uh, it was when we signed the deal with Surtech at the time and they started translating the game for the American market that they came back to us with realms and reams of suggestions and corrections, or not corrections, but uh, ideas how this experience could be improved. And we looked at them and said, yeah, you know, we should have thought of that. And, you know, why didn't we see that? So what happened was the English version was ended up being completely different than the German one because we incorporated a lot of the suggestions they made and improvements and made it a better game that ultimately appealed more to the American market. And again, when we started developing Star Trail, we had that feedback, we had that experience, we had gone through the transition to make it a more accessible game as a whole. And changes like the user interface in Star Trail are really a result of that, that we learned we took the, the, the feedback too hard. We, we realized, okay, this is not working for everybody. Uh, this is really targeted at complete hardcore players who are familiar with the pen and paper game. We have to step away from that mindset and just make it more accessible for other players who have never heard of it in their life. Can, can you give me an example or, or two of this, these sort of improvements or suggestions? Um, it, 
it's been so long that I don't really remember exact details. I mean, the user interface is definitely one, and the guidance of the player, you know, how we ease them into certain things is, is just different. We improved on that and made sure things are a little more accessible, more understandable. And also, at one point, I don't exactly recall when that was, but at one point we made the decision to take out the travel map. And because there were some features in it that some people took vehement exception with. I remember the review in computer gaming world at the time <clears throat> where the reviewer was really just complaining about how hard it is to travel overland in this game because you had to constantly feed your characters. <clears throat> You had to make sure you had enough water with you. You had to make sure you have enough food with you. And, but not only that, because the characters wouldn't feed by themselves. So every couple of you know, miles, you had to stop and feed your characters manually in order to make sure they're not starving. Otherwise, you would end, you know, you, you, know, you come up at the end of the tunnel in that city you wanted to go to only to find there they all died. You know? These sorts of things. And it was a tedium that was in the game that especially American audiences didn't respond to so well and that was also what Surtech told us you need to get into that we need to get rid of this to make it really a better game and those were probably the key changes and that's all for this week's episode hope you guys enjoyed that now if you want to contribute to Guido's Kickstarter, you've only got five days left to do it. There's quite a ways to go. Uh, sometimes these Kickstarters pick up right at the end though, so uh, we can be optimistic. I've personally gone in and doubled my contribution. I was at the uh, $55 level, bumped it up to the $110 level. The uh, kind of cool thing about that is you'll get two copies of the game uh, you can send to a friend. So hopefully more people will do that so we can get to that. Uh, Pledge goal. Uh, also, uh, don't forget you can get the Realms of Arcania uh, 1 and 2 and 3 all on GOG.com. Uh, but please don't just go there directly. I'll have a link in the show notes. And if you use that, uh, Matt Chat will get a small kickback. Won't cost you anything extra. So uh, please, if you want to play the game, uh, do it that way. And by the way, the GOG package, really nice. It uh, has everything there to install itself. Uh, plus, you get the game manuals and the clue books and the soundtracks and wallpapers. I mean, it's fantastic stuff and it's dirt cheap. So, uh, please go check that out. As always, uh, thank you very much if you have supported this show. And uh, I'm going to do something special this week. It's probably silly, but um, if you're kind of on the the fence about whether to support Guido's Kickstarter or whatever you would normally contribute to Matt Chat uh, this week, uh, please put it into Guido's Kickstarter instead because uh, I really want this project to make. I'm going to be really sad and <laughs> disappointed, probably more so even than Guido if it doesn't make because I'm a game with rat factions. I'm really on board with that. Um, okay, anything else there? Don't see anything. Okay, what about that ale of the week? Oh man, this week I've got something. Uh, really special. This is a hallucination. Uh, this is from the Lucid Brewing Company right here in Minnesota. It's Belgian style ale brewed with white grapes. And I don't see anything else about the bottle here. Apparently this is made in collaboration with Parley Lake Winery. I guess that must be where they get the grapes. And it's a 12.5% alcohol by volume, so it's uh, on up there. Hopefully not too bad, but considering a Budweiser has something like six, almost twice as potent, so I'm <laughs> going to take this one nice and slow. But anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this hallucination here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Uh, I've been smelling this, and i got to say the, the aroma is just really, really lovely on this. You can definitely smell the wine. They say they got some white grapes in here. You can definitely smell that. You also smell the sort of Belgian style hops in this. Kind of a very citrusy kind of aroma to it. Just, just very, very nice. Almost like champagne. This is what it really reminds me of, uh, aroma-wise. Anyway, let's give it a taste. And, uh, a toast to you, Guido. Uh, good luck with that Kickstarter. So close. Uh, five days left, guys. I really hope you'll head on over there. But anyway, here we go. Okay, a lot of flavor in this one. Sort of, a, you can definitely taste the white grapes. It almost <coughs> tastes like a little white wine was mixed into this. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Also, you can taste the sort of Belgian ale. It almost tastes like you had a nice Belgian ale and then you poured some uh, white wine into it. Uh, not a bad uh, mix, actually. Qu quite a nice combination of flavors going on here. A lot of citrusy um, action. It was just sort of popping in my uh, mouth here. <clears throat> yeah, just really, really good uh, flavor here. Um, so this is definitely something you'd want to sip on for a while. <clears throat> I kind of like these uh, uh, ales like this because even if you're not a big beer drinker, but maybe you like uh, wine and champagne, you know, this is something uh, that I think just about everyone would enjoy. So definitely really going to put this one. I just love this one. I'm going to uh, give it a full five out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, definitely one of the best ales I've had in, in quite a while. So uh, that's Hallucidation by the Lucid Brewing Company. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I found a quotation from the great French author Voltaire. It goes something like this. Originality is nothing but judicious imitation. See you guys next week. He's, I've got to get him off those rocks. Do you want me to lift him off the rocks? No. I need you to stand there and be quiet. <laughs> Cody, quit laughing. <laughs> Cody's laughing. I'm like, what are you laughing at? This is not funny. This is a deadly, venomous snake. It could kill me if it bites me. <laughs> Cody, quit laughing or I'm going to throw this thing on you. I was two seconds away from throwing it on him and see if he could laugh that one off. <laughs> I didn't know this was a comedy. Mm.